What a blessing to be here where more than anything else, the name of Jesus is lifted up. Your Excellency, the President of Republic of Kenya, Dr. William Ruto, and First Lady. Your Excellency, the Vice President and Second Lady. Excellencies, the speakers and members of parliament. Honorable Chief Justice, Justices of the Supreme Court and the judges. Excellencies, the cabinet ministers, ambassadors, and the diplomatic community. Excellencies, the leaders of the majority and minority parties in parliament and also out of the parliament. Fathers, chiefs, and leaders of all religious bodies. All other dignitaries and invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. The beloved and brotherly people of Kenya. It's an honor and privilege to be in this beautiful land. It's my utmost pleasure to be here and see many of my Kenyan best friends. May my special thanks extend to the parliamentary organizing body for this special event, for having me at the Kenya prayer breakfast. It's indeed a blessing. Allowing me to share part of your life at this conjuncture of circumstances is a unique opportunity, for I am grateful. My soul cherishes every moment of my stay, feeding the plethora of reminders. I congratulate you, President Dr. Ruto, on your recent successful state visit to the United States. It's a signal of God's favor, and at the same time, an increased accountability for the people of Kenya and Africa, for its diplomatic altitude. It's an inspiration for Africa that the delight is sincerely shared. I want to convey my special thanks on behalf of my family to the people and government of Kenya. 24 years ago, my wife and our two children were forced to flee from their country and ended up in one of the Nairobi refugee camps and stayed for three years while I was under politically motivated imprisonment by the Zen government for 12 years. During those darkest periods of our family, Kenya became the ray of hope to my family. My son, who was seven years old then, always gratefully remembers now that Kenya taught him to speak Kiswahili and gave him Kenyan friends. The theme of this year's Kenya prayer breakfast, hope, and my privilege as a speaker made the meaning of hope too personal. The fact that hope is reverberating from this place also made it too Kenyan, and for that matter, too African in the prevailing circumstances. I call my life journey the pilgrimage of hope. When I decided to join my friends as a teenage student in the 1970s, with a vision of transforming 
the oppressive and poorest Ethiopia into a free and prosperous country, the driving force was hope. When a handful of us left our homes, abandoned our loved ones, fled to the mountains of Ethiopia, and fought in armed struggle for 15 years to the point of losing our lives. For the cause we believed in, the overriding power was hope. During the breakfast, during the darkest 12 year segment of my prison, life in solitary confinement, hope was my only anchor of survival. However, in the first five years when I was engulfed in total hopelessness, my spirit died. I attempted to commit suicide in prison twice. I had nothing left except dreaming of death until a person called Jesus of Nazareth appeared in the middle of the night <laughs> through his light and gave me hope miraculously that I would not die. I would get out of prison and I would live for testifying his name around the world. That is what happened later after I got out of prison. And as he promised, he let me travel around the world except Australia, and I wish someday I will go there, <laughs> and lifted his name for many thousands of people to come to him. Then hope empowered me to figure out a new purpose while I was in prison, which restored my spirit, allowing me to defy death and start finding the meaning of life and personal growth in a new way. I understood I had to do my part, I had to do my part to keep hope alive and make the new dream of living would come true. It was then that I learned and practiced what the Harvard Leadership Studies coined the shift of mind from ego system to ecosystem. Years before I read and knew about this theory, it's about a recovery process from survival to make a journey of hope to fruition. I stopped looking and all thinking from the outside in and started looking from the inside out. I began understanding myself as part of the whole problem. The socio-political environment, instead of thinking myself as alien and immune. It was not difficult for me to embrace the biblical concept of metanoia, shift of mind from the old way towards the new, the truth and the eternity. I remember the day when I said to myself, I would do it differently if I were the leader of Ethiopia now. It was a deep understanding of myself as part of the nation, as a socio-economic political environment from ecosystem to ecosystem. The years I spent in prison for this reason became the most beautiful time of my life. Viktor Frankl, the Auschwitz Nazi concentration camp prisoner, said in his book, The Meaning of Life, 
I quote, when a man finds that it's his destiny to suffer, he will have to accept his suffering as his task, his single and unique task. He will have to acknowledge the fact that even in suffering, he is unique and alone in the universe. No one can relieve him of his suffering or suffer in his place. His unique opportunity lies in the way in which he bears his burden. My fellow Kenyans, I brought these things not to tell my story as such. It is to understand Kenya's journey of hope through the eyes of the story. A nation is like a person. It passes through sufferings, ups and downs, and frustrations of various colors and works through a pilgrimage of hope. Kenya, too, has had its journey of hope amidst the ups and downs and frustrations. Bishop Desmond Tutu reminds Kenya today through the Zen South Africa, saying hope is being able to see that there is light despite the darkness. When your forefathers fought the colonial ramshackle and started rebuilding the nation, what did they have except the hope to be free? Despite the colonial evil surrounding them, Kenyan founding fathers hope was the spirit of freedom in the patriotic song Harambe. I remembered my seventh grade Pan-African history teacher who taught us to sing Harambe in our classroom. It's still fresh in my mind though I can't say it now, all the lyrics. Harambe, Harambe, to Imbe Pamoja, to Jengi Serikali, Watu wa Kenya Hatuna Uwagazi, Kela Rangi Tunependa, Wengi Walisema, Kenya Itakua Matata, Watu Walde Wastarabu. I would love this uh, beautiful choir, which we saw earlier, to sing this. Harambe, harambe, to embe pamoja. Harambe, harambe, to embe pamoja. Harambe, harambe, to embe pamoja. To jengi serika. That's all I can go. <laughs> Kenyan forefathers sang Harambe for freedom and Harambe for unity and nation building. It's time that this generation of Kenyans should sing Harambe again to break poverty and shine like the dawn. The Zen Kenya shouted Harambe to defy colonial servitude, while the now Kenya will shout out loud to become the beacon of peace, equality, and prosperity through integrity. <laughs> Kenya will become the pride of Africa because, said the poet, Hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune of a dream. However, my fellow Kenyans, I have the caveat that Kenya's hope can flourish and bear fruit only by undergoing the practice of metanoia. And that must, I repeat, must start with the leaders. 
Kenyan leaders, critically starting from the three branches of government, all the way to the business, religion, education, and academia, etc., must stop externalizing and look into the deepest corner of their hearts first. The leaders must start relearning that they are the primary reason for Kenya's problems, shift their minds, and become models for renewing and restoring Kenya's shattered hope. The late famous Ethiopian singer had a song that says, when you point out with your index finger to others, the other three fingers, these three fingers, point to yourself. Years ago, I asked my Norwegian friend, who served as Norway's foreign minister and finance minister, to tell me the magic of Norway's phenomenal position in the world. As you know, Norway, by all indexes of development, are at the top of the world, be it economic, political freedom, happiness, they are the most happy people in the world. So I was inspired by that and asked this friend of mine, Norwegian friend of mine, how did they do that? I expected him to give me a one or two hour lecture to help me understand the intricacies of nation building so that I might copy it for Ethiopia. He said to me, and I quote, it really boils down to one foundational thing, and that is trust. If leaders can build trust among, other, among their followers, if, this, if the government can be trusted by the people, the dreams of the nation can come through one step at a time. Hope built upon the foundation of trust becomes the pillar of social fabric that creates miracles. The first and foremost action of the leaders of Kenya is to shift their perspective from ecosystem to ecosystem perspective. Never consider it easy to think that well, let alone to practice it. However, it's not impossible. It only needs to resolve to do the impossible possible with the help of the following story. And I was at the national uh, conversation yesterday in that meeting, and I observed one very important thing there about Kenyan leaders. And that is that all Kenyan leaders have acknowledged and knew and are aware about Kenya's problems. And this is the most important thing because it's half of solving the problem. And I will, I will, I will proceed to the story, this story. More than 2,000 years ago, there was this teacher who promised all the lofty and beautiful things for a group of people who came to him to listen to his teachings. Excited by what the teacher told them, they started wishing to be his students or followers. Knowing what they think, he said to them, I quote, if anyone wishes to follow me, he must deny himself and set aside selfish interests and be willing to endure whatever may come to believe in me, confirming to my example in living and if need be, suffering or perhaps dying. For whoever wishes to save and love his life in this world will eventually lose it through death. But whoever loses and hates his life in this world will find it for all eternity. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world of wealth, fame, and success but forfeit his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? This teacher, as you know, was Jesus of Nazareth and the students, his disciples. 
he demonstrated to them how to deny himself for, ser for, st for serving others, and they did what he showed them. This is from the book of Matthew, the message version of translation. Is it a huge demand? Resounding, yes, but worth it. When and if the leaders start practicing this, they can no doubt build trust among the people of Kenya. Then and only then can they lead the people with an authoritative moral ground. Hope is the mother as well as the offspring of purpose. The power of hope inspires leaders to lead with purpose and the people to live up to it. And clear purpose in return springs ever reinforcing renewal of hope. Without a purpose, though, hope can diminish and eventually will die out. In that sense, we may say that purpose is a flame of the hope. A few months after I started living in the United States, I asked myself this question. If America, only with 200 years of history, becomes so prosperous and at the top of the world, why Ethiopia, with thousands of years of history, remained among the poorest? It's a huge question. Maybe even difficult to obtain a consolidated and closer to the truth answer. However, it's a worthy question and a timely inquiry for such an era like we have now, especially for the current generation of Kenyans and Africans. The question led me to a nearby library and studied the founding America and found out three fundamental things. Number one is trust in God. That's why Americans say, in God we trust, even though now they are forgetting it. Number two, a clear and transcendent purpose, vision of their context, an idea for themselves. Number three, selfless band of leaders. These are the three foundational things that I found out from my study about the founding America, not the now America. And finally, these things created the we, the people of hope. I think Africa lacks all, or at least a few, of these basics. Africa needs African idea. A purpose that learns from other countries' experiences, but basically tuned to its nature and serves our context. We don't need copying. We need adapting. Because I have a painful experience of copying communism, socialism, to Ethiopia and failed. Most importantly, Kenyans need selfless leaders with purpose-driven leadership. Selfless leaders create selfless people. Leadership is influence, right? A shift from ecosystem to ecosystem which demands self-dying. As studies show, can establish people's social consciousness that defies immorality, stagnation, and degeneration. This kind of people, in turn, breeds hopeful, dynamic leaders from among its generations. I deliberately focused on leaders, not the people, for the sake of time. After all, if the role of leaders gets right, it's not difficult to shape the people's minds. Have you noticed in the biblical stories that God's anger is very strong and his punishment is merciless when it comes to leaders most of the times? When the leaders of Kenya make themselves right, they will have the power of reinventions starting from government all the way down, which is critical in solving problems, for example, corruption. Reinventing institutions includes 
reviewing old policies, laws and regulation structures, and of course, the manpower, as you of course know more than I do. However, we need most important characteristics to reinvent institutions. Have you wondered why the Bible refers to two wild animals in particular? Especially one wild bird and one wild animal, an eagle and a lion. It's all over in the Bible. Have you wondered about that? Neither elephants nor hippos, big ones and very strong ones, but not. Not vultures nor, of course, hyenas, but eagles and lions. I found it from my readings. There is no other animal or animal bird like the eagle with a clear and far-reaching vision and a swift action. And there is no other animal like a lion, especially the African lion, like here in Kenyan safari, with confident courage and integrity. These are the most important characteristics of eagle and lion respectively, among other characteristics, of course. Hope-driven Kenyan leaders need to master these characters in their leadership to let the hope of the Kenyan people flourish. We are lucky that His Excellency, the President right now, is among the courageous leaders in Africa who speaks his mind. I'm not saying this to flatter him. I don't know flattering people, except God, but because it's a fact. I have been following his meetings, I have been following his speech, and I have become very much interested in him recently. That's why I'm saying this. Clear and far-reaching vision like the eagle, and confident courage and integrity like the Kenyan lion. The vision factor is easier for you. You already know it more than I do. I don't have to preach this for you. The courage factor may be itchy and even painful in consequence, primarily because it needs courage to cut from oneself one part of a body from yourself. And it needs courage to perform surgery on vested interests in laws, in institutions, structures, etc., but rewarding in results. Allow me to bring Barack Obama's words here. Hope is not blind optimism. It's not ignoring the enormity of the task ahead or the roadblocks that stand in our path. It's not sitting on the sidelines or shirking from the fight. Hope is that thing inside us that insists, despite all evidence to the contrary, that something better awaits us if we have the courage to reach for it and to work for it and to fight for it. The young generation of Kenya, you don't have to be reminded that you have a special responsibility and also urgent task for this nation. There is a traditional saying in Ethiopia that says, if you want to learn about the past, sojourn in the homes of the oldies. If you want to see the future, take a walk with the young. This is your time, Kenyan youngsters, to make a difference by learning from the elders and by showing them your restlessness against the status quo. Not by force of arms like I did in the past. 
not bringing AK-47 and say, freedom comes out of a barrel of a gun. No. Freedom comes out of the barrel of peace and humility in the name of Jesus. But by reason and vibrance, you are the vanguard to bear the burden of Kenya and Africa. Unrelenting pursuit of hope and dream must be your sine qua non. One final thing and I'm done, ladies and gentlemen. Let's not forget or shove aside our successes and achievements, even though they are very small. Let's recognize, celebrate, and embrace them, our successes, our achievements, with thankfulness. It helps us to be inspired, passionate, and encouraged to do more. Only with care, not to be complacent and egocentric. Humility must be the rule of the game with Harambe the song. Let Kenyans rise and sing Harambe again. Thank you.